Welcome everyone to the inaugural Innovation Expo at UC San Diego. Uh, this is a campus-wide initiative to celebrate student work uh, in innovation at UC San Diego. I for one am very excited and honored to have you all here. And today's theme of the expo is health and wellness. So without further ado, let's get started. And just to give you all a brief cover who I am, I am your MC. My name is Christian. I am a senior political science major in public law. And I am also an entrepreneur in my own self. I have focused most of my endeavors in bringing together students. And I want to begin first with the land acknowledgement that we all have to understand. So the UC San Diego community holds great respect for the land and the original people of the area where our campus is located. The university is built on the unceded territory of the Kumeyaay Nation. Today, the Kumeyaay people continue to maintain their political sovereignty and cultural traditions as vital members of the San Diego community. We acknowledge their tremendous contributions to our region and thank them for their stewardship. I also now want to introduce our Chancellor, Pradeep K. Kosla, who will give us a welcoming to this expo. Hello, and welcome to the inaugural Innovation Expo. UC San Diego encourages a culture of collaborative and interdisciplinary activities, activities that promote sustainable economic development and enrich our society. We also encourage entrepreneurship across our campus and teach its principles both inside and outside the classroom. We do this so that students and faculty learn to embrace and manage risk. It is through this process that we find novel approaches to solving problems, where knowledge and risk intersect, innovation happens, and Tritons have an excellent track record for innovation. We are ranked number three in the nation for startup creation. In the past few years, we have made even greater gains in developing our entrepreneurial culture. More than 14,000 students have participated in our entrepreneurial programs and our efforts to make it easier for faculty and researchers to quickly move innovation into the marketplace has also paid off. More than 1,000 companies around the world use or have used our technology created at UC San Diego. That is innovation at work. That is economic development. And that is Triton Impact. To further our entrepreneurial tradition, I'm delighted to support this inaugural Innovation Expo. This event supports, fosters, and promotes inclusive entrepreneurship within our innovation ecosystem. The focus of this year's Expo is student entrepreneurship in health and wellness. Our goal is to encourage students to explore the entrepreneurial journey. Our hope is that their journeys will lead to change making and solutions for pressing health challenges. So I look forward to hearing their ideas and witnessing their journeys to innovation. Thank you all for coming today and please enjoy the expo. All right, thank you so much Chancellor for that welcoming. And again, this is a wonderful expo for us to celebrate students and their work. So I now want to introduce our next speaker, which is uh, Dr. David Brenner, the Vice Chancellor of UC San Diego Sciences. Hello, I am David Brenner, the Vice Chancellor for Health Sciences here at UC San Diego. I wanna welcome you to our campus-wide celebration of innovation and entrepreneurship. The focus on health and well-being is appropriate given the worldwide pandemic that we are in. Our campus has been remarkably successful in counteracting the pandemic through innovation and collaboration. For example, UC San Diego has performed more COVID-19 testing than all of the other UC campuses combined. And we have done more COVID-19 vaccinations than all of the other UC campuses combined. Students make a critical contribution to innovation and I want to encourage our students to explore the entrepreneurial journey. We are all looking forward to welcoming all of you back in the fall. In the meantime, enjoy the symposium. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Brenner, for that wonderful message. All right, so to give you guys a little overview of what we're gonna be doing today, we're gonna to have our pitch competition, which will be between our all of our semifinalists when they will have a time to show off their work and be questioned by our judges. It'll be a very flash forward event. We're gonna go right in. We're gonna to to introduce you guys to the teams 
they're going to give you their pitches and they're going to get questioned by the judges and that'll be how we're going to determine. Uh, next, we're also going to have a prototype and demo fair where we're going to be introduced to some other change makers within the community. We're going to show off their own work and inventions throughout the, their process as entrepreneurs and inventors. So, and we're also going to have a, a very audience driven participation with this particular event because you guys are going to be able to have a poll and a live Q&A with these innovators. And then after that, we'll have an intermission and a musical act by another one of our student creatives on this campus. And then finally, we'll end with an announcement of the winners and a celebration of the work that's been done today. So to introduce our semifinalists, we have Alga, Jeweled, Nanomood, and Stasis, and finally, Tester. These are the semifinalists who are competing for our grand prize today, and I wish them all the best of luck today. I now want to give the floor to our judges who have graciously given us their time and their efforts. And I want to have them all briefly introduce themselves with their full name, their title, and the UC San Diego affiliation. And we'll start in alpha order. So judges. Hi, I'm uh, Carrie Anaiti. I am an EIR at UCSD and also work as an active angel investor for socially driven and purpose driven impact um, startups. So nice to meet you all. Looking forward to the pitches. Hello, my name is Eugene Sato. I am the program manager for the Device Acceleration Center at the ACTRI at UCSD. Uh, my affiliation is I am a UCSD alumni. I completed my PhD in bioengineering here. Uh, good luck to all the competitors. Good afternoon. My name is Sam Ward. I'm the vice chair of research and innovation in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at UCSD. Good luck to all the teams. Exciting inaugural event. My name is Shaheen Anayati and uh, I'm also part of the EIR program at UCSD and uh, help startups in uh, through our personal uh, LPs. So good luck, everyone. All right, Some big names in here. So I thought let's get started. So good luck, guys, and let's have this fun. So introducing Nanomood. Over 350 million people suffer from depression worldwide, with the annual economic burden to the U.S. estimated at over 200 billion as of 2010, with costs growing at a rate of over 10% per year. Currently, we lack an effective way to detect and monitor physiological biomarkers associated with depression. Early detection, intervention, and precise treatment could promote re-emission, prevent relapse, and reduce the emotional and financial burden of depression. Nanomood is a first-in-class wearable wireless nanosensor monitor for multiple depression biomarkers. Our sensor will be comprised of a microneedle patch capable of sampling biomarkers in sweat, interstitial fluid, and blood. These biomarkers are interpreted using a machine learning algorithms, providing real-time monitoring to improve the health and well-being of people struggling with depression. Professional users, including clinicians and researchers, as well as patients, are provided an intuitive, user-friendly interface. The system is designed to be secure, reliable, scalable, and high performance. We seek to work with high profile academic institutions and pharmaceutical companies to establish our product's effectiveness, collect data for regulatory approval. These relationships beginning with UCSD Health will establish our brand and help define our applications. Upon completion of our prototype, we aim to obtain FDA approval and leverage a new FDA program that streamlines funding for advances of urgent healthcare importance. Nanomood will be sold domestically and internationally via a direct sales force, distributors such as drugstores, and eventually through an online subscription-based platform. 
The medical sensor market size was at 5 billion in 2016 and is expected to grow to 12.5 billion in 2025. However, we expect to outperform the forecast global market growth in medical sensors, just as Dexcom outperformed the glucose mo monitoring market growth. Dexcom, which provides a wearable blood glucose monitor for diabetes, reaching a market capital of 35 billion in 2020. And we believe that we can achieve similar successes with a wearable monitor for depression. Our team of experts in neuroscience, computer scientists, engineers, and industry professionals will lead Nanomoo to create this nanosensor and execute our business plan. We're actively seeking to build a diverse board of experienced industry experts. A creative approach will empower individuals with depression to manage their mental health and wellness, to improve outcomes and reduce cost. Thank you for your consideration. Inquiries may be sent to nanomoodtech at gmail.com. Okay, it will be doing a quick Q&A by the judges. Uh, so I have a quick question. Um, nice presentation and good idea, but what, what market research have you done to demonstrate that this is a product um, that will be adopted by both medical professionals, insurance, as well as the end um, consumer? Um, I can take your question. Thank you so much. Um, I apologize, my video is not turning on. Um, but the, so the market, the research that we have done was exclusively focusing on medical sensors. So as mentioned, um, we are looking at the uh, bigger scope of the market, which is currently is at, um, well, it was at 5 billion, is expected to go to 12.5 billion. Our end consumers will be uh, patients who are either um, diagnosed with depression and or undergoing uh, treatments for depression. So we are hoping to reach these uh, consumers, but in the process initially to start off our uh, prototyping, but as well as our research and development, we want um, to um, partners with, with um, research institutes, including universities, um, as well as uh, pharmaceutical industries to implement this technology and generate um, early preliminary data uh, to understand this technology further before we reach our end consumers. Thank you for the presentation. Um, just briefly, is is the goal to uh, use this biomarker information to titrate treatment and medication, or what's what's the end goal? Um, so the monitoring device that we're building is not to detect, let's say, the uh, the treatments that our patients are undergoing. Uh, we are detecting if if they are undergoing a treatment uh, toward a certain target where whether that's directly or indirectly, we're trying to monitor the biological markers that are associated with depression. So let's say if a patient is going some type of treatment for depression and it's blocking or inhibiting a certain target, the downstream of it has an effect that we want to monitor being the biomarkers. Thanks for the presentation. This is Sam. Uh, can you tell me more about your sensors? Do you have IP on the sensor? Is it a, is it a, multi-sensing device or is there, how does that work exactly? So uh, uh, the patent, we're currently in, in, in process to uh, write the patent and to get the, uh, the device uh, patent so we have an IP on it in the future. Um, in terms of the uh, multiplex detection of the devi device, we're hoping to uh, monitor multiple detection of uh, multiple, sorry, biomarkers that are associated with depression. Uh, so that is being the multi-plex uh, aspect of it. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we want to detect biomarkers that are in, in, in different um, biological fluids. Uh, so sweat interstitial fluid, as well as blood to have a full on spectrum of, of um, and a full on range of, of different biomarkers to, that are associated with depression. Hi, quick question. Uh, um... When you talked about the, the medical sensors and you talked about the, the market size, 
think you mentioned uh, a high enough dollar amount. Uh, however, that's medical sensors in general, right? It's not specifically to depression? Right, so that is the medical sensor um, market cap. Um, there, currently, there aren't any uh, medical sensors that are particularly for depression. So the, the dominating um, aspect of the market will have to be the glucose monitors. Um, this comes one of the companies that are manufacturing and producing these glucose monitors, uh, but there's also Abbott uh, as well as other companies. There are a few startup companies that are entering this market that are detecting um, certain uh, markers, but for different indications. Um, however, again, going back to what I mentioned, there aren't any um, uh, a medical sensor or a biosensor or a nanosensor in that um, being said that are targeting depression. Okay. Thank you. Good job, guys. Um, I don't think we have time for another question, but I think we just want to just thank Nanomood for their wonderful presentation and wish them the best of luck. And thanks for time. And now we move on to our next presentation. So I'm introducing Stasis. Hi, we're Team Stasis. Meet Richard, a retired businessman. He's had some trouble with his gait over the past year, but it's gotten much worse over the past month and he nearly fell on his back. He thought it's best he get some help from a doctor. Because it's unsafe for him to travel alone, he got some help from his wife and they together they traveled to the doctor. And the doctor said, he should seek some consultation from a physical therapist and he needs more data to be able to conclude anything about his condition. And so they traveled to a PT and within the first two sessions, Richard seems to do much better, but his progress stagnates. And the truth behind this is over 90% of Richard's time is not spent in the PT's clinic. At home, he doesn't have access to the exercises and does not remember how he did it at, at the PT session. The problem is that there is no communication between the doctor and the PT. And Richard is inconvenienced by having to travel to the PT each week, especially considering his condition. This is, um, can be dangerous for him. And so there's a lack of remote patient monitoring from both doctor and PT uh, with Richard. Current gait analysis tools lack remote monitoring services. Doctors and PTs cannot remotely track progress of patients. Self-help balance analysis tools do not provide personalized feedback. And to emphasize the significance of this problem, 33% of elderly Americans experience a fall each year. In 2020 alone, the total medical cost of falls was expected to reach around $68 billion. To address this problem, our solution is a show in soul that provides personalized real-time balance feedback and training. The way it works is simple. A user puts the shoe insole into the shoe and it immediately starts collecting balance and motion data and sends this information to the doctors and PT. Our AI algorithm, which is integrated into the insole, analyzes a user's weight, distribution, and other properties to determine the best feedback response for the user. This haptic feedback response guides the user to move their feet into a more stable position. This data is also sent to doctors and PTs, allowing them to monitor the patient's progress remotely. For Richard, this means he can be at three places at the same time. The experience for the doctors and PTs is also transformed into something like this. Our data analysis tools is integrated into existing EHR systems that doctors and PTs are all already used to and are not burdened by having to work with another app or a service. At home, Richard still has access to personalized real-time feedback to maintain his posture and balance allowing him to spend more time with his family. The market we're after is that of rehab services. The TAM is approximately $450 billion, SAM $5 billion, and SOM $430 million. We've separated this by region, United States, California, and San Diego, respectively. We're after a B2B model with a software as a service uh, product. In the customer segments, we're targeting our healthcare finish clinics, PT clinics, and healthcare facilities. Our key partners will be medical institutions, rehab centers, and EHR system developers. The, the way we plan to make money is by selling our, the hardware insole, EHR integration, and SaaS model, and providing exclusive membership to a product. 
we stand out because we're building a bridge between the PT and the doctors and saving them money in this, in this process because they now have the opportunity to work with more patients in the same time window. There are many companies out there that make insoles. Some make insoles for diabetic patients and others make insoles for golf players to improve their swing because at the end of the day, it's all about balance enhancement. But we're not directly competing with these because we've got a high accuracy pressure sensor protected by our pending utility patent. And not only that, we've got an AI algorithm that provides personalized feedback, correcting their gait at real time. And most importantly, our solution can integrate directly into existing EHR systems that PTs and doctors are used to working with. And um, finally, we're priced at a comfortable level of $299. So far, we've been focused on MVP development. And we would like to move on to pilot testing towards the end of the year. And by December or early January next year, we want to start, start raising funds. We'll, we plan to use these funds for clini clinical trials and establishing partnerships. And finally, we plan to complete sales and scaling by the end of 2022. Our found, we're founded by an engineering team from UC San Diego with diverse skills in engineering and teamed up with a team from the Ready with where one of them is also PT himself. Our advisors are experienced senior entrepreneurs in the medical device market. Thank you. All right. I felt myself adjusting my posture as we were listening to that. Uh, just a quick note to the audience. Uh, the pitches are exclusively for Q&As for them. And if, but if there's enough time after the judges have finished delivering and have given their questions, we're welcome to pull from you guys. Uh, but that does not mean the audience will not have participation during our prototype pitches. That's the time for you guys to get involved. So get ready. So judges, take it away. Uh, nice presentation. And I really do like the idea. Um, my question is about your, how you're doing on prototype right now. You say there you have a patent pending on utility, but was just wondering mm -hmm. what your progress is. Do you have an actual prototype that you've been testing or are you still in the idea phase? We're midway between the idea and the testing phase. Uh, we've had an initial prototype, which we've concluded is not sufficient to issue out to users to actually do pilot tests on. And so we had to go back and reiterate into a more robust MVP. And we are two, two months approximately away from our MVP to uh, the point where we can issue it to users for them to use in their own uh, with an instruction set. And we'll get access to that data. And so just to add on to that, the utility patent, is that about the AI or is it, is it, inter, is it connected with the sole that you're going to be putting into the shoe? So one it, utility patent we've got is actually the way we're detecting pressure. Most, pressure uh, most insoles use off-the-shelf pressure sensors, which do not allow for high accuracy sensing. But we've got one that enables high accuracy uh, sensors with more pressure points. And the other is for the AI algorithm and how we are actually providing the feedback and the applications it has in multiple markets. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I have a quick question about uh, your market and looking at your market. Um, you mentioned rehab in general. Is that specific for um, rehab related to the lower body or is that a, a more broad uh, definition of rehab? Uh, we've looked at the broad definition of rehab and we've separated by region because we understand this is a, an overestimate and we wanted to start with just uh, San Diego first and then go after the, uh, well, start with UCSD Medical and then go after the San Diego. But we've uh, looked at um, overall rehab, but also we've noticed that um, the core of, of the costs come from falls, a patient falls. And when a patient falls, especially when, when they're elderly patients, when they fall, they have to undergo rehab. And uh, most of this is, is, is um, related to gait um, enhancement and gait development. And so we've stuck with that because we found the data to be more reliable from our preliminary uh, market research. Nice job on the presentation. Can you tell me a little bit more about the haptic feedback loop? How, first of all, how, are, how is the information cued to the patient to change their gait mm -hmm. and you do that mm -hmm. fast enough 
uh, during a gate cycle to actually change gate. Right. So on that stage, the way it works is the AI detects exactly what is wrong with this patient's gate and then determines, okay, which type of epic feedback they should use. So there are vibration motors embedded in the insole, which vibrate at a specific frequency and a specific orientation and um, path. So we have different set of vibration motors. And for some patients, they react better to a high intensity vibration, whereas others, it is the opposite way. So the AI learns the user's pattern over the first month or so. So there's a calibration phase for the first week, and then it gets better and better over time. And as it vibrates, the user, user uh, tends to listen to it better and better. And that way their, their feed, uh, their gate is corrected. And we, um, at a theoretical level, yes, we have consulted with uh, Dr. Vire. He's a gate expert in UCSD. And he's confirmed that it is, this is sufficient time to uh, correct a person's gate um, uh, within the few seconds that we have. And we're currently uh, testing that out um, to, to confirm that at a, during their pilot tests. Thanks for the presentation. Can you talk about the SaaS aspect of the model? Because you, you only right. mentioned a dollar amount of two ninety nine, dollars and I'm assuming that's right. the insole. Right, so that was the hardware insole. The SaaS is uh, our part of sort of our, uh, our value prop because most products right now sell the insole as a product and that's where they're adding value. But we will work with physical therapists to integrate the, uh, the data that we analyze into their existing platform so that they don't have to learn a new platform. So the software analysis is what we're providing to PTs and doctors. All right, great presentation and great questions for everybody. So next we'll move on to our next. Introducing Tester, your digital health passport for safe online dating. Hello, we're Tester from the University of California, San Diego Reedy School of Management. We thank you for the opportunity to present the Innovation Pitch Expo this year. The problem that we're tackling is a trust problem that exists between online dating apps regarding sexual health. Dating websites don't offer a solution to verify the sexual health status of a user, causing the users to rely on each other and trust in each other's sexual health before pursuing a relationship. We know that people are seeking safer options for this, but that there are also access issues to receive testing. We also know that STIs or sexually transmitted infections are on the rise. Dating apps do allow for individuals to have access to a greater number of partners, leading to a larger number of these casual partners than ever before and rising in parallel with this have been the rates of STIs. We're also seeing growth in the online dating market with a greater than $3 trillion US dollar revenue generation in the past year alone. Our solution for this problem is Tester. Tester allows for STI verification, letting users upload their tests and validate them. Users get a Tester badge, allowing us to show that you care for your health. This facilitates disclosure of your results, allowing users to share their results with potential partners, and this does it in a secured and protected way, so that the user only has access to their own PHI and that other dating apps or other users cannot gain this access. Testing is integrated with the system, allowing us to contract with labs to help users get tested and encourage frequent testing. And this allows for contact tracing, which lets health departments treat individuals quickly who become sick. The advantages here are first mover advantage, as no STI verification or disclosure option exists in dating applications currently. The privacy control and validation offered by blockchain allows for consent-based sharing, and the direct integration allows us to iterate directly with dating apps with no need for some secondary app or widget. We looked at multiple models for this, including B2B and B2C, and we found that the B2B model involving directly the dating apps would be the most profitable and also the best way to get off the ground. This would be a subscription model service with the opportunity to contract with laboratories and then users in the future. When looking at the market opportunity, there's a 3.2 billion global paid online dating market, which is up to 160 million users. 
In the U.S. market alone, there's a potential for $600 million, which represents 33 million users, with a target market of 127 million in the U.S. market, which is about 7 million users. We learned that 50% of online dating users are between 18 to 35, which is our target market, and about 10% of those receive an STI during their dating life. When looking at market segmentation, we plan to target female users through the Bumble app because women using this app make the first move in regards to contacting a potential partner, as well as the gay community, which represents approximately 30 million users in total. In terms of financials, we hope for a go-to-market strategy that has an ideal MVP in six months. We partner, want to partner specifically with Bumble to start uh, due to the women being able to choose their partners in this app with a goal of at least 2% of their market within five years. This will be a subscription-based model with an estimated revenue at $120 million at year five. When talking about the competitive landscape, there are multiple competitors but only Tester offers a decentralized data storage, the users having sole ownership of their personal data and linking to data profiles. The other companies all control the user's data. We did market research, conducting interviews to gain perspective about dating habits, and we gathered data on the app usage and sex and sexuality and comfort with sharing personal information. We found that users express interest in knowing about their partner's sexual health and that they hope for transparency but that they expressed interest in providing health data only if it was secure and validated. In performing a SWOT analysis, we found significant strength in the advantage of blockchain and early use to the market. Um, and we did notice that there were some weaknesses in that we do require partnerships with online dating services and laboratories. But there are opportunities in the public health sector and also outside of the health system because the digital health idea can be used in other ways, aside from just health alone. Our team is consists of April Garoli, who is executive project manager, and she is also um, in communications and PR at Dropbox. Dr. Michael Shea, urologist and director of the men's health department at UC San Diego. Param Narayanan, financial performance manager and in business intelligence at Illumina. Ferdinando Olivieri, project manager and app technology expert from Qualcomm. And I am Mark Schultzel, an orthopedic surgeon and medical director of the health tech company, Rivara. So um, a qu quick question, probably needs a quicker answer than you can, you can do with this, but the team, um, why you guys? Um, you all have very different uh, backgrounds. What brought you together to do this? Hi, so thanks for the question. Uh, as as um, the presentation mentioned, we're a group of MBA students. So this actually stemmed from a class project for a blockchain class that we were tasked to come up with a uses case for blockchain. Um, so we're in the process of finishing our MBA um, degree. So, so these are the original team members and we're in the process of trying to take this from a school project into a real world entrepreneurial project. Thanks. Um, so I'm watching this presentation it reminded me of the discussion on vaccine passports. Um, and I know they've been in a little bit of a bad rap recently. I was wondering if you'd comment on how this may differ or face similar challenges as a uh, vaccine. Adoption. Sure. Um, obviously, digital health passports, um, it's a thing of the current um, state. Uh, and that during the COVID pandemic, there's definitely an increased interest of that. Um, that's not our particular target and our use market because um, the similarity exists in the sense that we're trying to build a platform that can support um, private data management and and sharing consensus-based sharing of sensitive data, um, um, but this is mainly used to with a goal of reducing the STI pandemic in a young population, and also hope to improve trust in the online dating community. Thanks for your presentation. Can you comment on how you leverage blockchain to manage PHI and achieve contact tracing? Um, sure. Uh, 
as you know, blockchain is a platform that um, that's uh, is enabling a lot of data, complex data management. Um, and uh, Mike, I can take this one. Sure. Uh, Go ahead. Sure. Um, hi, Sam. Uh, this is Param. So uh, from a blockchain standpoint, one of the things that uh, that attracted us to using blockchain as a platform for this is because of the uh, the security and the privacy uh, options it offered, as well as having an immutable ledger. Uh, so if there is any sort of uh, uh, request for sexual STI verification from one potential user to their uh, potential match, uh, and the other person consents, that's all part of a ledger, as well as any testing that they have done, uh, or like, you know, those all will be there. We are still in the... Uh, reviewing certain aspects of which uh, of the health uh, data will go on chain versus off chain. So that's something that's like, you know, uh, we are in the process of uh, determining or finalizing, but the idea behind blockchain was that like the immutable ledger will help you give uh, like, you know, if you had requested uh, for STI verification information of someone and if sometime in the future of that, per, uh, if that person turned out to be uh, a, they tested positive for STI without divulging any of the information about the person who uh, who tested positive. We might be able to like in a one uh, like in a send out some sort of a message to anyone else who may have requested their information. Hey, uh, it would be a good time for you to get tested in case you may you may have come into contact with someone. You mentioned that you partnered with Bumpo. Is that true, or uh, is that a, a wish? So that's uh, that's not true. That was like you know we uh, we put together some uh, revenue model based on if we if we are able to capture at least one percent of Bumble's paid user market. So there were some projections based on that. And, and how do you prevent them from doing it themselves? Because it sounds like you don't have IP around this. Yes, at this point, we don't have IP on this, but uh, with Bumble or any other dating service, they might turn out to be one of our potential competitors if they end up doing this themselves. But the uh, one of the goals behind Tester is that not just have this as a service just for one platform, but make it as a service uh, for every platform out there, uh, which is very similar to like, you know, uh, Bumble offers is LinkedIn verified, uh, right. where someone can put in their LinkedIn profile and that will say it's LinkedIn verified. So this would be a similar service behind the scenes like LinkedIn, but for STI, STI yeah. verification. All right. Good presentations and a lot of good questions in the chat and everything. So uh, it's really good invention. So go look to, to tester. Next, we have Alga. Take it away, guys. We're Alga, an international and interdisciplinary team dedicated to creating sustainable solutions for both people and the planet. And today, we would like to talk to you about an unaddressed issue in healthcare. Plastic pollution is an enormous problem for our oceans and environment as a whole. We have all seen the discussions over plastic bags, straws, and so on. Something that is in everyone's home, however, and is nearly totally unaddressed are Band-Aids. First aid Band-Aids are almost entirely made of plastic derived from petroleum and cannot be recycled composted, or biodegraded, and currently must be incinerated to be rid of. To give you an idea of scale, from 2010 to 2020 in just the U.S., it is estimated that 42 billion simple Band-Aids were sold. These problems of Band-Aid waste are growing and are only going to continue to grow as more people purchase Band-Aids, more are produced, and more markets open up, leaving millions in our land, our oceans, and because of their contribution to microplastics, probably in your food and you. We at ALGA don't think that in order to heal yourself, you should have to harm the environment. So using the principles of nature and biomimicry, our vision is to create a sustainable, biodegradable Band-Aid composed of algae. Through our research and discussion with algae bioplastic experts, we believe that algae can be the single source of our product, allowing us to make the strip, the adhesive, and the pad. And that includes all of the essential properties such as sterility. Algae is already being utilized in hospitals and higher grade bandages known as alginates, where they have proven incredibly effective. We want to transition the use of algae in wound care from the specialized use to the general market. 
And we believe that this algae band-aid won't just be better as a product for the user in the environment, but the creation of it will actually benefit the environment. Because of rising ocean temperatures, toxic algae blooms are increasing across the globe. These algae blooms can actually be harvested to create bioplastic, meaning that we can clean the environment of toxic waste at the same time as being provided source material. Based on our interviews, we foresee our first adopters being sustainable and environmentally conscious adults. However, we believe that there is a big opportunity for growth from this sector into mainstream society. Sustainability isn't just spreading through society culturally, it's even being mandated by governments. Just the other week, Canada announced that plastic is toxic and that they're working to ban single-use plastics. Band-Aids are a single-use plastic and unlike some other products, are going to have to remain single-use. Besides there being societal and social trends pushing for this, this is also a very good time to enter the market financially. With no large competitors in the space, Band-Aids as an industry are growing yearly and new markets are emerging. Our primary source of income will be the selling of the Band-Aid through direct and indirect traditional channels of trade, such as wholesale distribution and resellers. Because of the nature of our product, we foresee platforms that cater to environmentally conscious customers to be the main sources of our beachhead market. Examples could be a Whole Foods or an online site such as Public Goods. From there, we would then expand into more conventional establishments such as CVS. For additional income, we're looking at the sale of algae waste that is a byproduct of the production process. Algae waste and byproducts are already being used in farming and fertilizers. Lastly, costs would include production equipment, facilities, technological licensing, and materials. We're operating on the current vision that we would produce this ourselves. However, we are looking into partnering with established first aid companies to reduce these costs and get into the market sooner. So we are Alga and we are creating a, tr a truly sustainable Band-Aid. We are entrepreneurs with a passion for sustainability, biomimicry and innovation and are committed to improving the welfare of the planet and those inhabiting it. Miriam drives the ethos of our project with her expertise in ecological design thinking which guides the sustainability behind ALGA. Christina brings her expertise in working with algae and other sustainable biomaterials from her work as an industrial designer and leads the technological development of the project. And for myself, my background in cognitive design and entrepreneurship helps lead the team in utilizing human-centered design principles, finding viable channels for product development, and organizing the workflow of the team. Together, we combine our skills, knowledge and passions and believe that with these we are well on our way to creating our solution and taking our project to the next step as we continue conducting user interviews researching and striving toward our prototype milestone so thank you for your time and ask us anything on your mind thank you Uh, one question about um, your prototype. How long will it take you, do you think, to get um, your first MVP? We were thinking somewhere between three and six months. It kind of depends on a couple of things. But uh, the things that we would first do as our first steps would be uh, finishing our CAD model. Uh, we're currently working with uh, some modeling uh, in, uh, I can't remember, the printing lab at UCSD that could help us work on our designs. And then from there, uh, we would uh, develop our first strip with our producer and test it up to, you know, Band-Aid guidelines because there's set rules for that. So uh, that would take place in probably three to six months. And have you looked into doing any IP with it? Um, well, we would be looking into doing IP. Currently, uh, the plan is to license it through uh, the researcher who has developed the process of making this bioplastic. So we would partner with them, uh, license their uh, technology, and then since we're combining it in a novel way, that would be our IP. Thanks, do you have a sense of the price point of what this bandage um, would need to, need to be to be competitive with existing bandages? Okay, yeah. Um, so people are used to the idea that sustainable products need to be more expensive. And that does, doesn't deter them from uh, willing to pay that price. Uh, sustainable products currently are growing at seven times the rate as anything else. And if you look at regular consumer Band-Aids through Johnson & Johnson, they're around, I think, 10 to 20 cents per Band-Aid. 
And if you look at the only competitor right now who makes a sustainable Band-Aid, which is Pat Strips, they're around 75 cents to a dollar per strip. So our goal would be underneath that. And based on the scalability of algae, I think we could. Can you comment on uh, any shelf life related issues of your, your prototype concept versus a regular Band-Aid? Uh, no, if you, once something becomes a plastic, at least in this instance, I can't speak for other bioplastics, but it essentially is exactly the same as polyurethane. So in the process that we would be using, anything that can be made out of polyurethane, including like the adhesives, uh, would perform exactly the same way. You could sterilize in the same way as you are currently sterilizing single-use bandages. And yeah, the, I can't think of a single reason why it wouldn't. The only thing you'd have to be careful of is the fact that it is biodegradable. So, I mean, you wouldn't want to have your product, you know, in a wet environment anyway, but there is the risk of that if you decide to keep your Band-Aids, I don't know, in a pool. understand. Try to keep them out of the pool. So if I, if I can add to this, so we, we've looked into um, the, the problems of creating something biodegradable at, at length. So we were having the same concerns as you have. So in order for something to biodegrade, they need constant, a constant environment of factors, factors like moisture, like Austin had mentioned. So if you keep them on a shelf, I don't think that creating a biodegradable band-aid would impact the shelf life of this product. Uh, hi, yeah. you, you mentioned that you know the customer patch strips, which is the bamboo uh, bamboo product. Do you know how much of the market segment they have? Like uh, as a percentage of total Band-Aid sales? Yes, correct. Uh, I do not. Uh, last research I saw on them, they're doing uh, like, I think, 7 million. So a very small fraction of total bandages. But they are the only person making sustainable bandages. So, so you would think that they would be able to capture a lot, lot uh, bigger size of the market since they're the only players on there right now. Uh, I, I suppose so, but they have some limits with their bamboo sourcing and they're also a pretty small company. I mean, the company that owns Patch Strips, that's all they do. And their um, distribution is pretty limited. So I know they're trying to get bigger overseas, but uh, one thing that we've ran into is that a lot of people who have aware or they were aware of the product they weren't able to actually get it thank you all right very good presentation and very uh eco conscious of, if i may say so it's really good to see some working very diverse presentations so now to introduce our next and last presenter jeweled take it away guys Hello everyone, my name is Daniela, and I'm one of the co-founders for Jewel the Dating App, transitioning into a more meaningful relationship. I identify as transgender, which means I don't exclusively identify with my sex assigned at birth. Today I want to talk about a problem with the transgender community. When I started transitioning, I gave up on the idea of love. I assumed that love was something that just wasn't meant for me. This is based on my previous experiences with dating apps that would sexualize and just fetishize me. I even used sketchy sites such as Craigslist to find matches. I remember I went on a date with a guy and he took me to a movie theater. He bought our tickets and then we sat down. But before the movie started, he told me he couldn't handle being with me in public. And he got up and resold the movie theater tickets and just left me there stranded. This is what dating was like for me. I used to receive paragraph long death threats from men explaining how they wanted to murder me. For the longest time, I didn't want to be transgender anymore. 41% of transgender people have attempted suicide. We have higher rates of isolation, depression, homelessness, unemployment, and violence. Over 350 transgender people were murdered last year alone. Transgender adolescents have disproportionately higher rates of dating violence. I ask everyone, how do we transition to a more empowered community of belonging and safety in the transgender online and dating world? 
While I present to you Jewel, the dating app, transitioning into a more meaningful relationship. Jewel is unique from other dating apps because on Jewel we focus on personality over physicality. Users will take a unique personality questionnaire to identify them as a personality type or gemstone, which will then be compatible with other gemstones as they find their ideal match based on compatibility. We'll also incorporate psychosocial therapeutic features at the tap of a finger and community building chat rooms and a map feature that will locate the closest gender neutral restrooms, LGBTQ resource centers and trans clinics. We'll also have a trans education verification process for all users. Only trans people will be allowed to message first on Jeweled. We'll also incorporate push notifications with daily quotes, statistic and trans history and have a strong sense of security and surveillance. A study was done by the Journal for Social Personal Relationships in 2018 that showed that trans individuals in successful relationships actually have reduced psychological distress. And regardless of their stigma that they felt towards a relationship, low or high, they had decreased depressive symptoms if they were in a high committed relationship versus a low committed relationship. Jeweled goes beyond a dating app. It's a wellness app. In terms of our market size and trends, Williams Institute did a study that showed that 0.6% of Americans identify as transgender, which is about 2 million Americans. This is twice what it was a decade ago. And if you look at just the Gen Z population alone, it's actually twice that at 1.8%. Match did a study back in 2018 that showed that 56% of LGBT singles have dated someone online, with trans singles dating the most online. A study was done in JSPR in 2019 that showed one in eight individuals are open to dating a trans person. And Aptopia showed that due to the pandemic, there's been an increase in 1.5 million daily active users across the top dating apps. If you crunch some numbers, our projected market size is about 43 million. Our business model is a freemium business model with Jeweled Unlocked for monthly paid subscribers. Jeweled Unlocked, you'll have access to unlimited swipes, unlimited distance radius, and see who swiped on you. Jeweled Unlocked will be $10 per month, and based on Tinder's 2019 data, we assume about 8% of users will actually take advantage of this subscription. This gives us a 34.4 million monthly revenue based on subscribers alone. This is our roadmap. We came up with the idea back in 2016 in a nail salon, but finally gathered a team of three initially, now five, just last year in March. We pitched at multiple competitions and even won a few, such as the Demo Day at UCSD where we won the Excellence Award. We've interviewed over 250 future customers to determine a needs assessment and have been part of multiple incubators, including Starter Inclusion, Starter Impact, and Blackstone Launchpad. We've been on a podcast, have gained Instagram following, and just filled up paperwork to become incorporated. Our goal is to raise $150,000 for app development, marketing, and networking, and then launch our product in phase one in 2021 this fall. Avi and I are both co-founders and both in healthcare and realize the importance of health in trans dating. Ren is our graphic designer, Leland does marketing, and Alex does web design and software engineering. Thank you. Hi, Daniela. Good uh, presentation. My um, question is about... We're both here. Sorry. <laughs> nice to see you both. Um, so, I see a lot of pitches and I, dating is a huge um, market for new apps and communities. And I see your differentiation in the um, personality prototyping, the jewel part that you discussed. And I'm wondering if, if this instead is more of a community app than a dating app. Um, and just maybe talk more on that, on the, Maybe, maybe it's a, a, a feature or is it actually more the goal? It's definitely, I would say both. So it is a dating app, I would say primarily. The goal of the community building chat rooms is so that trans users can basically com find camaraderie with each other. Because oftentimes trans people can't find each other in public settings all the time. It's like really difficult because you know, 0.6% of the population is trans. And so the community building chat room is a way for trans people just to connect with other trans people while at the same time having an additional feature of dating. So I would say it's, it's both. I agree. It's a, technically, it's a dating app, but we like to promote it more of a wellness, speech, uh, wellness app because it does really work from the inside out. Like we offer features that um, use a psychosocial theories to help the person kind of, kind of be um, 
100% themselves in order to go into a relationship. Thanks. Uh, my question is, you mentioned uh, higher rates of homelessness and unemployment um, within your, your user population. Um, can you comment a little bit about what the risks are in having like a, a subscription-based uh, pro, uh, program when you work with a population that has uh, higher rates of homelessness and unemployment? Yeah, it, it's it's actually, sorry, maybe it wasn't clear. It's a freemium based model, uh, just like most dating apps are. Only if you want to have access to like the jeweled unlocked feature, which is more for high end users that want like more further distance radius, seeing who's matching with them, accessing more map features. Uh, but it is a freemium model that's based on ads and things like that. So it's just like a typical dating app that's, that's freemium. And I do want to add that our niche demographic is the transgender Gen Z population. But when we did our survey with participants, 40% of our survey um, participants were actually heterosexual cisgender men. So that was another market um, space that we never thought about tapping into. Yeah, I think that's important what Avi said, because yes, we're a trans dating app, but you have to remember we're also catering to trans attracted individuals. And due to that study back in JSPR, it shows one in eight US Americans are open to dating a trans person. So that actually encapsulates a bigger chunk of the market and the trans people alone. Thanks for a nice presentation. Uh, I was struck by the, the power of the story at the, at the beginning and the comment about security um, during the presentation. And I, I recognize that some of the features of this might be, or it was noted would be, uh, reserved for people who identified uh, in this way. How do you how do you manage security? That's a great question. I think it's, um, we would set up uh, protocols, especially from the get go, we want users to understand that this is a transgender centric dating app. And we want it to create a culture in a way that they're not using this to fetishize and hypersexualize a trans person. So I think just by the design alone, it'll set that tone, but obviously we cannot um, screen everybody who are trans predators. Um, we can only do so much. So the features like um, the intake forum and also just having a report feature and also just having a robust um, security software system. Yeah, and she alluded to it, but the trans education verification process is a survey that all users will take. And it's a 20 question questionnaire that makes the user educated about the trans experience. And I really think that will prevent predators from necessarily using this app willy nilly because they have to kind of go through a wall to even message users. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, you, you'd mentioned that uh, you would only allow a transgender person to respond to the message, is that correct? Oh, oh no, they initialize the message. So only trans people can initiate messages. It's kind of like a la Bumble, where only women can message first. On Jeweled, only trans people can message first to avoid- uh, how, how, are you going to, how are you going to verify or confirm that that person is, is uh, really so, transgender? So you're technically, I guess, anyone could identify as they wish in the gender identity right. selection, but- um, you're gonna have your profile and everything. And if, you know, users would be reported if it becomes known that they're not trans identified and they're actually cis straight men trying to message first. Got it, thank you. All right, great presentations. That brings us to the end of our pitches and our judges Q and A's. Uh, right now, the judges will now leave us and they will go and have to deliberate. And while they deliberate, we will welcome with another wonderful message from Sandra Brown our Vice Chancellor of Research. Hello, I'm Sandra Brown, the Vice Chancellor for Research here at UC San Diego. I appreciate having the opportunity to share my thoughts on the innovation at UC San Diego, especially as it impacts health and the well-being of our local community and the communities all around the world. <clears throat> I could speak at great length about the innovative ways that our campus and our researchers have responded to COVID-19. We've conducted multiple clinical trials to help uh, evaluate vaccines. We've developed nanosensors and wastewater assessments to provide early detection for SARS-CoV-2. Um, we've uh, filed uh, inventions with new ventilator designs and produced epidemic 
models and forecasts that have, are unsurpassed in accuracy and methodological sophistication, all of which help our Return to Learn program that's uh, allowed a remarkable number of our students, our faculty, and our staff to return to campus. We've also been able to come together with the community in new ways, like programs uh, such as Earth 2.0, Co-Respond, a platform that during the early days of the pandemic was able to connect people in need of quick information and solutions with researchers and engineers and students and medical experts, along with community members who could provide solutions. We believe interdisciplinary work is the most fertile ground for innovation. The Institute of Engineering and Medicine, for example, integrates engineering principles and novel technologies with biomedical and translational research opportunities. Uh, they have worked on everything from at-home COVID uh, testing kits to wearable sensors that can monitor heart signals and biometrics. Another health-related innovation is our groundbreaking work in climate change and the worsening health of our planet, the pollution, uh, global warming, increased natural disasters has a direct and a long-term impact on the health of people everywhere around the globe. Whether it's measuring the temperature of the ocean with a Keeling curve or creating a foundational understanding of atmospheric rivers to better predict storms, our Scripps Institution of Oceanography is at the forefront of the environmental and climate science. UCSD Scripps has also partnered with other UC campuses as well as universities across the globe to create Bending the Curve Climate Change Solutions. This is an educational program that empowers climate change champions from all around the globe with the globe goal of improving human health, food security, and access to water through a shared curriculum. UC San Diego is taking the lead in energy research also, advancing energy storage technology, microgrid operations, and higher renewable energy generation through the Center of, for Energy Research sustainable power and uh, energy center and the DER connect. But it's not just researchers making the difference on our campus. Uh, sustainability issues are supported by staff, by students, by our faculty. Our sustainability goals are focused on improved electric vehicle infrastructure, moving towards zero waste, constructing green buildings, and conserving water and reducing food waste. This barely scratches the surface of the innovations that are happening at UC San Diego every day. To the students participating in this expo, if you're interested in healthcare related research, I encourage you to explore the innovation programming that's available through the Office of Innovation and Commercialization, the Rady School of Management and the Jacob School of Engineering, among others on our campus. Your work can help us make the world a healthier, healthier place for everyone in the future. Thank you. All right, that was a really good presentation from Sandra. Uh, I also want to let you, let you all know that the rare question move next into our prototype demo. This is where we get to hear from other students and their inventions and their prototypes. This will be very similar to what we just experienced. They'll be giving their own pitches. Each of the teams will have 90 seconds to pitch each of their, their prototypes. This is where you guys get to be really involved and get to solve all your questions. And you will also be involved in a poll, which will be the ones to select our winners of the prototype demo fair. So we shall begin with our 90 second video with our beginning with Mariah. You feel some slight cramps all of a sudden, quite literally out of nowhere at the worst possible time, whether that is right in the middle of an important exam or right before you have to give that big presentation. You hope for the best. However, you realize that your period has started. While you might have a pad or even a tampon on you, there's nothing that you can do about that gaping red stain on the back of your brand new jeans. 
This narrative is far too common among people that experience menstruation. And many people think that the only solution to this is to carry around an extra pair of pants, which really isn't feasible. But I present to you a new solution, Mirai. Mirai is a convenient pocket-sized spray that removes menstrual blood stains, or any blood stains really. Using Mirai is as simple as spraying some of the liquid onto the stained area and wiping it off with a tissue. But don't take my word for it, let's take a look. Beyond the typical list of foods to avoid, nutrition support is virtually non-existent in healthcare delivery. We started Cebus Health to tackle this very problem, a personalized nutrition platform where a doctor can prescribe not just healthy foods, but also the support that comes with it. As a clinician, you would simply log into our platform, sign in, and prescribe a personalized nutrition program. In our case, Dr. Cardi B, with input relevant patient information along with the procedure, the medications, and the program length. Once prescribed, an instant alert will go to that patient's cell phone. And that patient will log in, and we instantly ask to update their profile. In this case, Robert will update his information, his health status, biometric information, and food allergies and preferences. He can also manage his meal, look at upcoming week's menus, rate his meals, delivery options, meal planning, and even log in his food. Robert can also go in and look at his progress, look at his macronutrient composition and the trends and averages for the weeks and months. Robert can go in and also get the support that he needs. He'll get upcoming reminders of appointments and also be able to talk directly with his nutritionist. He'll get alerts and tips of the day. The best part about the Seba Health platform is that as a clinician, Dr. Cardi B can log in and actually see how Rob is doing. She'll get his daily inputs and she can look at his nutrition dashboard and also look at his engagement level. This will give her a much broader view over how well Robert is managing his chronic condition. All right, that's some good presentations, right, guys? So I'm going to open up the poll. And this is where you guys get the chance to engage with our presenters. And now don't be shy because we have a lot of questions and a lot of presentations. And I want to take this time to sort of want each of the presenters to turn their cameras on, introduce themselves, and we can begin our quick Q&A session. So Amora, would you like to go first? 
Yeah, so I am a first year student at UC San, at, oh, at UC San Diego. Um, I'm majoring in biochemistry and this is something that I started working on in the senior year of my high school for a business competition called DECA. And I kind of just, um, I left it for a little bit and I thought um, it would be nice to get this product started back up again because it's something that I'm passionate about and it's something I know a lot of people relate to. Next. And if the team of Cebus like to introduce themselves. Yes, uh, Polly Pichota here. Um, thanks for thanks everybody for joining. Um, I came out of the UCSD Integrated Nutrition Program, the certificate program, and um, with Cebus Health, this is a company that we're actively trying to launch and commercialize. We've developed a prototype and have done some early stage pilot testing on the um, patient end, and we're looking to sort of move this forward with developing the technology and also doing a um, clinical study. Um, with the university to, to, to push this ahead and actually commercialize it at one point in time. Thank you. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm muted. Anyway, next from the team for one millimeter. Um, hi everyone, I'm Anne and I'm representing one and, um, and Armor Lab at UCSD. Um, we're from the structural engineering department, and um, we want to transfer our uh, the technologies develop develop in our lab um, to the commercial um, field. And our most mature technology is the this thing called motion tape, um, which is a wearable sensor that uh, measures body ranges of motion. Yeah, thank you. All right, so I guess I'll just start with the questions. Uh, this is an open question for all you guys, but we'll go ahead and start with, you know, Mariah. Uh, so first of all, could you tell us like how long you've been working on this project? Uh, yeah, so I think I started this around my senior year of high school. So it's kind of been like around a one, one and a half year thing um, in terms of like uh, developing a formula and name and everything and like deciding like what type of medium um, and size this product should be. So I'd say I've been working on this for about like a year and a half for it so far. Cool. Sebus? Yes, um, so we, uh, Michael and I, who's my co-founder, we, we came up with this um, idea. I think it because it comes from a place of our heart, in our hearts. Michael actually has a condition where he actually didn't have any nutrition support when he left the hospital. And I had a lot of experience on the nutrition side and also with my dad who who passed away from uh, uncontrolled diabetes. And so this comes from a place of love. And um, we have been working on this for since, you know, early 2019 and, um, and, and trying to just work through it and, and seeing what, what solutions can we bring to that patient um, to kind of make it easier for them when they leave the hospital and that there is uh, way more support than there really, really is now, which is just nothing. Um, so in a way we developed a solution for us and we hope that it will help others as well. And then from Armour. From 1MM. All right. I think we'll go on to my next question, which is, what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced uh, in creating this prototype? I think this is something that really is comes up on a lot of times when you're going through the process, figure out how you're going to pitch it, figure out how you're going to create it, why are you creating it? But I think there are a lot of challenges that go on spoken of. I think a lot of people look at the final result. So could you guys speak a little bit about the challenges that you faced to get to this point where you are now? Yeah, sure. I can start off. So I think one of the biggest challenges that I faced was trying to come up with a, a formula that would fit this because I kind of had a vision for what type of product I wanted. So just kind of like trying to like use um, like what I knew about chemistry to come up with something that would work towards this end goal that I wanted. And um, this is something that's not as common, but something else that I had a little bit of a challenge with was coming up with a, a name for the brand, which is um, so for me, I decided, uh, I took inspiration by using the word Mirai, which means to disappear in my mother tongue, Tamil. 
so that's kind of how I got the the name for that. So I think like just as important a product is, uh, its name is just as equally important and something to consider. Hi, and I think um, I think to address that question from my perspective, it was really hard. I think as an entrepreneur, as you're going on this journey, that you have this solution in your mind, right, and you think that it's going to work like X. But I think what's really important for me is to actually surround yourself with people who have a different perspective um, and being able to get those inputs that are to you. Because sometimes you're thinking so deeply about this issue or this problem that you're trying to solve that you kind of run into this like rabbit hole mentality. So for me, the challenge is actually getting that external perspective so that you have way more clarity and that will make actually putting something in 90 seconds a whole lot easier because because there's a, the, you know, being able to say, okay, take all the stuff that's in your mind and articulate that in a manner that's 60 seconds for someone else to understand. As founders, that's often really difficult because there's just so much you want to convey and there's so much passion there that I think having the external perspective allows you to have more clarity in how you present your solution and thinking about it in a different manner. So I would suggest maybe surrounding other, yourself with others that are, you know, that have that come from a different set of backgrounds and can view this product very differently than you. Great. And from 1MM? Um, I think uh, obviously there um, on the way there were many, many challenges. Um, but one of the biggest challenges for us, I guess, was trying to to find a way um, to mass produce our sensors. So we started um, almost from scratch and we manually uh, spray on our sensors. And right now we're just trying to figure out what's the best way um, to uh, mass produce this for, um, to, for it to become a commercial available product. Thank you. Cool. So remember everyone, the polls will be closing soon. Make sure you get your votes in there soon. Uh, I guess my last question, uh, Actually, let's we have one from the audience from Douglas. Um, all right, will Luno still detect blood after use of your spray? Um, so that is something that we need to test because this product is pretty early in the developmental phase. That is something we will take further in our next rounds of testing, like on a larger scale. Okay. And a couple of you have worked with some of the campus innovation and entrepreneurship programs. What kind of assistance did you guys receive? Uh, you guys could just fill, jump into when you. Okay, I'll jump in here. Um, so I, I was part of the IGE has their phase one company this year, and I found that that program was hugely impactful for CBS Health, anyways. And I think to be surrounded by so many great mentors and advisors, you know, walking you through this process. There's a there's a, a really great structure on that program where they can really help, kind of you know, help you think about your problem and and what you want to convey. So for me, I found that the UCSD IGE program was amazing. And, um, and we, I, I learned so much. So I would recommend that program to anybody in this, in this audience. Yeah, and same with Polly, um, one and them also participated in the um, IGE MedTech Accelerator program. And we all learned a lot and got very good um, advices from all the mentors. So highly recommend it. Thank you. All right. And then were there any lessons you guys have learned through the process that you'd like to pass on to others who are maybe on the tippy toes or just on the precipice of saying, let me try to be an entrepreneur. Let me try and get my, my ideas out there. What do you guys think would be the best advice to those who are thinking about getting into this? Uh, yeah, again, so something that was really helpful for me is I just start, I just tried to talk to current entrepreneurs, even if they weren't in like a field relevant to mine. So like I've talked to like a couple of restaurant owners and I feel like just by talking to a lot of people in general, especially like entrepreneurs, you can learn how they do business. And even if the industry isn't the same necessarily, there's still a lot of things you can learn. Like people have different business models that will be successful. So you can like pick and choose like which ones, which aspects you wanna follow and which aspects um, you wanna come up with your own. So I think the biggest thing would be just to like reach out and talk to people and get feedback about your product to see like what people want. Um, Cause ultimately that's what makes a successful product or a business. 
I would totally agree with what Maria said. I would say, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're jumping into this, focus on your customers. Who, who's going to use your product? How is it going to be benefit them? Because like I said, you may have a vision for something, but it may not translate, that vision may not translate to who's using your product and who's valuing that product. So getting into your mind, in a way, what you think doesn't really matter, it's what your customers think. And, and being able to get into their head and how they're gonna use the product, how they think about your product. I think that's the most important aspect of actually delving into entrepreneurship is, you know, do your initial customer um, discovery work. Really, really get deep because you can't, you can't create a model without your customers, so. All righty then. Well, I think we're out of time. Uh, let's go ahead and move on. And remember guys, participate, get those questions in and next we shall move on to our intermission. And we have a wonderful intermission performance from one of our digital artists and musicians at UC San Diego, Luis Flores Cuevas. And enjoy. Hello, everybody. My name is Luis. I'm a graduating Cogsci student, an artist, and a musician. Thank you so much for logging on to this event, celebrating innovation and entrepreneurship. Being a creator takes patience and unyielding dedication. We're here to congratulate those who give themselves to their art completely and persist despite every failure. They continue to stand up for what they believe in. This song, is called All of Me, a jazz standard, and I hope you enjoy. All right, have fun. Thank you so much, Luis. That was such a wonderful presentation. Uh, I really love how this event has really celebrated the interdisciplinary nature of everybody here. I think that's what's at the core of UC San Diego innovation and creativity. Uh, and I think that's also what our sponsors love us as well. So I want to give a big thank you to our sponsors, AWS and Paul Hastings for helping us put on events such like this, because it's really important to give, give back to the community, which we uh, thrive in. So, and I also want to give thanks to our idea partners and our ideas council here. We have many, much support and we couldn't have done without them. And of course, thank you to all of our judges for your time and your expertise in these fields. And I know the choices you've made will be very impactful to the rest of us. All right, now without further ado, let us announce and thank to our mentors finally, Kelly Carr, Sonia Stanway, 
Murray Rachel, Albert Liu, and Alan Waskin. Also, thank you to our planning committee. And we couldn't have put this event on without them. It's going to be another great time once we do this again. And again, we also couldn't have done it without you guys. This is for you. And we couldn't have done it. So here we are, the semifinals. This is it, guys. Alga, Jewel, Nanamood, Stasis, and Tester, thank you for your time. Thank you for your imaginations. And thank you for everything you've done up to this point. Right, without further ado, I'd like to announce the winners. The third place going to Stasis. Congrats, guys. Second place to Jeweled. And without further ado, Alga with first place. Congratulations to Team Alga. You guys really impressed us today. And without further ado, I want to give the last prototype and demo for my interest winner, which is Morai. Congrats. It is a really cool invention. And I'm really happy we could have give you all the time and choices to show off your creativity and your imaginations was so proud so with that said a 25 dollars gift card winners will be announced as well at the end of this so congrats to you guys if you see your names listed on here please claim your gift card please email the basement at ucsd.edu and you will receive your gift card for participating so much in this event and again I want to know that this is an event to celebrate the work and imagination and hard work of everybody here. And this is for you guys. And we could have done it without you. So I'm happy. I know you guys are. Thank you for sticking with us as this event. And again, a big thank you and great work to everybody involved. <laughs>